that all right? Whether we recognize it or not. And I know you may say, well, Brother Mark, you don't know what's going on in my life right now. Well, that may be true, but I'm here to tell you, in spite of all, God is good. Is that all right? And he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think. Let us go to him together in prayer. Gracious Father, once again, we come hallowing your name in all the earth. Father, thank you for this privilege that we have together this day to praise your holy name. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy that we have received from you through your son, Christ Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, we ask right now as we humble ourselves to look into your engrafted word, which is able to save our souls, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to be attentive. And may we be attentive to our own selves. And may we look not to the left nor to the right, but may we all receive our own individual portion. And Father, we pray especially for those uh, in our midst today who have yet to obey the gospel of Christ. Uh, we pray that something be said from your holy word uh, that would prick their hearts and to uh, cause them to acknowledge the truth and to obey the gospel, Heavenly Father, before it's everlasting too late. And for those of us who have obeyed the gospel, may we uh, readily be attentive today as we have started our lesson in Sunday school on spiritual growth, a journey to Christ likeness. And may we all understand that if we're not growing, death occurs. Help us to grow. But may we see this morning the proper way that you want us to grow. We ask this prayer in faith and we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Peter 3.18 2 Peter 3.18 says, but grow. Amen, somebody. But grow. This last verse is the key to this whole book of 2 Peter. It's the theme and the sum of it all. But grow. But it's important and critical for us to understand how we are to grow. In other words, the, the focal point of our growth has to be in something. And that something can't be us. Amen, somebody. So he says, but grow in what? Grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Is that all right? But we have to take a moment, if you just uh, bear with me, we have to take a moment to understand the context in which he says now in verse 18, but grow. But grow. Is that all right? So in verse 17, amen, he says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing that you know these things beforehand. He, he intimates that they already have prior knowledge of something. So watch what he says. Seeing that you know these things beforehand, beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. We need to pay attention this morning. Amen, somebody. 
And this is not a scare tactic sermon. This is just the truth. He, he intimates that they already have prior knowledge of, of the danger of falling into error, being seduced by those who, because they are unlearned and unstable, amen, they rest the truth. Look with me in verse 16. He says, also in some of his epistles, speaking of them, of, of these things, in other words, he's saying that Paul spoke of this same stuff that I'm speaking of, amen, in which are some things hard to be understood. Now watch this. He didn't say all things are hard to be understood. He didn't say some things are impossible to be understood. He didn't say that you need a pope to interpret it for you either. Is that all right? You see, sometimes when we're studying the Bible and we don't immediately, under, immediately understand, sometimes we give up. But we don't do that with anything else. Sometimes you just have to dig into the word of God. Pray for understanding. Is that all right? The eunuch said, how can I understand except some man guide me? He says, which they, watch this, that are unlearned and unstable rest. Now, I need, it's important for me just to touch on this a little bit. And I'm, I'm going to make sure that I take very cautious attention to how I say what I say. Because I'm learning, amen. I'm learning that just as critical as to what you say is how you say it. Is that a lot? So when he says unlearned and unstable, the definition here is unlearned is speaking to those who are untaught. And because they're untaught in the truth of God's word, they're incompetent in the truth of God's word. Not only are they untaught, but they're unstable, which means that they're unsettled and unreliable because they do not remain fixed in the principles of the truth. In other words, sometimes you, you have those who are just flipping and flopping in the scriptures. One minute they believe that the word of God says this, the next minute they believe the word of God says that. They're always vacillating. Is that all right? And they vacillate in the word of God, but they don't vacillate in what they think or theorize to suit their own desires. Y'all ain't get that. They don't vacillate in what they think or theorize to suit their own desires which are forever changing. You see, sometimes people try or seek to distinguish themselves as wise above others when it comes to the word of God. And when they do that, they, they always have to come up or they're always coming up with some new interpretation of the scriptures. Amen in order to justify the wrong that they're doing this year. Y'all ain't get that. Have to come up with a new interpretation of the scriptures in order to justify what we're doing this year. Now next year when we're doing something different, we'll have to come up with another new interpretation. And that's why I want to just direct you to this word rest. It says they rest the scriptures. Unable, unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures, watch this, unto what? Their own destruction. This word rest in this context speaks to the fact of twisting, distorting, and it, it actually has a connotation of torture. So in other words, it refers to taking the scriptures out of their proper place and meaning and thereby perverting, distorting, 
twisting and even torturing the word of God. Y'all getting that? Peter speaking here to those who boasted that they had a superior knowledge. The Greek word is epignosis. All right? Keep that in your mind. They had a superior or higher knowledge. And these are they who, rather than humbly submitting to the standards of the word of God as their guide, they take the scriptures and twist and distort them in order to suit their own self-satisfaction, their own benefit, and their own thinking, which ultimately creates a whole new set of rules. So you take the scriptures and you twist the scriptures and you create a whole new doctrine, a new set of rules. And what does that do? When a whole new set of rules occurs, what does it do? It contradicts the word of God. It contradicts the truth of God's word. And guess what it does? It lifts up the individual and not God. So that's why you got people who go around in the church and say, well, he knows that scripture. It ain't about him, as Willie pointed out in Sunday school. Amen, somebody. It's not about him knowing the scriptures. There's no private interpretation of the scripture. God is not a respecter of persons. What I know, you can know. What you know, I can know. And that's why he then says, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away by the error of the wicked. Beware. Now, this is important, y'all. Beware is a military term which emphasizes and stresses a personal, a personal and constant need to guard to protect and watch. It's not just my job to watch. It's your job to watch too. And guess what? The first thing we ought to watch is ourselves. Is that all right? It refers, beware, it refers to the uninterrupted vig vigilance in which a shepherd shows in keeping their flocks. The exercising of unbroken vigilance as a military guard. Now watch this. Many who have the scriptures and read them do not comprehend and understand what they read. And then too many of those who have a right understanding of the sense and meaning of the word of God are not always firmly and rooted and established in the truth of God's word. That makes us all susceptible to falling. That's why the Bible says, take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall. None of us are beyond falling. So we need to understand that because of our own selves, amen somebody, because of our own self-seeking pride, because of our own unrighteousness, that's in us. There are few who seek to attain to the knowledge of the truth of God's word and one true doctrine of Jesus Christ. Now let me put that into simple words. Many times, many people are seeking for something that feels good rather than what's the truth. We need to be those who are just seeking for what I just want to know. 
what God says. Is that all right? Are we getting this? I, I don't, I don't, I'm not looking for some, some place to where I feel all right. Amen. I want the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Is that all right? And, and we need to understand that now while there's many who, who really seek to obtain or obtain, attain to the knowledge of the truth, even fewer find it. And, and I mean this in respect to keeping it and maintaining the narrow way of godliness, which is the only way that leads unto life. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and the verses 13 and 14. Matthew chapter 7 and the verses 13 and 14. Watch what Jesus said. Jesus says, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Jesus is saying, ain't everybody going to heaven? Because not everyone is going to properly enter into the kingdom. Is that all right? Watch what he says. And many, many there be which go in thereat. Why? Why is it many going into the wide gate, the broad way that leads to destruction? Why, watch what he answers. He says, because, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life. And few, and few, and few there be that find it. That's why we said this morning in Sunday school, don't get, don't get concerned, amen, when you're alone or by yourself and doing the truth. Just keep doing the truth. Jesus said, fear not, little flock. And he wasn't lying. It's a little flock. The NLT says it this way. You can enter into God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. And its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gate to life is very narrow. The road is difficult, and only a few find it. You see, it's tough. There has to be a great deal of continual self-denial, continual humility, continual submission. I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I think I've already humbled myself. I think I've already submitted. And God says, no, you haven't. Take care of this. Here's something for you to humble yourself more. You think you something. You ain't something yet. Listen. Therefore, it's because of our own selves, not somebody else. It's because of our own selves that we're always in great danger of rejecting the truth and falling into error. And this is why we must stay rooted and grounded. We must always humble ourselves because as we just said, the, the truth of God's word is not always easy to receive. Not only within our own selves, but, but the enemy is always seeking to snatch it away from you. Is that all right? You're going to leave here this morning. Amen. Feeling great. And as soon as you hit that highway or that street, somebody going to cut you off. <laughs> Amen. Somebody going to cut you off and you're going to immediately forget what you heard. It's not always easy to receive. 
And this is what James is speaking to in James chapter 1. Let me hasten. In James chapter 1, look with me in verses 19 through 21. Many times we think that this passage of scripture is talking about us and our relationship to one another. Oh, I need to be, Lord, help me to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. When it comes to Mike, Mike, you know I might just get on my nerve. Help me to be slow to speak, Lord. That's not the context here. The context here is the word of God. He just talked about God begot us by his truth, by his word. Then he says in verse 19, listen. Wherefore, my beloved, let every man be swift to hear. Hear what? The word. That's why we always encourage every opportunity we have, let's come together together to study the word so that we can all be of the same mind and the same judgment. Is that all right? Be swift to hear the word of God. Be slow to speak. Be slow to speak against what? The word. Because sometimes when, when, I, when I understand what God says, you know, I'm like, man, I don't think it says that. Then he says, slow to wrath. What does this mean? This means we get to a point where the word upsets us so much, it cuts us so much that we have resentment towards it. And that's when we get into, well, I ain't like uh, the way Floyd preached. Or I ain't like the way Floyd talked because the way Floyd talked hits you. Y'all ain't getting this. He says, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. When we get resentment in our hearts towards the word of God, that's not going to produce the righteous living that God wants. Is that all right? Not only that God wants, but that God requires and demands. Notice what he says. Wherefore, wherefore lay apart, lay apart all filthiness and super, superfluity of naughtiness. The illustration is like taking off some clothes. But it's the superfluity of naughtiness is the overflow of wickedness. In other words, this is, we have a surplus of, of mess. Amen. That's not a natural part of us. Is that all right? And, and the word of God is trying to get rid of the surplus of the mess that's within us. Amen, somebody. And that's why it's so hard sometimes to, to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls because we got all of this wax build up in us. And that's what it's talking to. The superfluity of naughtiness is a medical terminology and it's talking about wax build up. And when you got a lot of wax build up, you can't really hear. So the mess in our lives within us makes it difficult to be able to receive this word. And God is saying, let me just cut that mess out of you so that you can receive it with meekness. Meekness means power of submission. In other words, I make up my mind that I'm going to humble myself before God. I'm going to submit. I ain't going to get mad at Floyd because he's the messenger. Amen. And sometimes we divert that. We get mad at, at the messenger because we're mad at the word. Amen, somebody. And that's why a lot of us in dealing with our families and dealing with our friends, we have to remove ourselves out of the way. Get yourself out of the way. If they're going to fight, let them fight against God. They won't win. Is that all right? Are we getting this? Watch this. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 19. I'm going to hasten now. I promise. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 19 further confirms how we need to humble ourselves. Okay? We need to abase ourselves. It says... 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 19 says, Don't fool yourselves. 
If any of you think you are wise in the things of this world, you will have to become foolish before you can be truly wise. In other words, when we come to God, I can't come with those things that I think I know. You see, what we don't talk about a lot is the difficult part and struggle of being a Christian is learning to forget everything that you thought you knew. Not just about coming to learn, it's also I got to get rid of all that other stuff that I thought I knew. Now I have to have a, a true open heart and an open mind to be able to truly receive God's word. Is that all right? And that's that pride in us that that's, we don't want to make our, we don't want to look stupid. We don't want to look like we don't know. But you, when you come to a recognition that this is about me and God, it ain't about you. I'm not trying to impress you. I need to get right with God. All right? It says you have to become foolish before you can truly be truly wise. This is because God considers the wisdom of this world to be foolish. It's just as the scriptures say, God catches the wise when they try to outsmart him. Can you imagine the, th the things I, I just sit up and the things I... I I, I say or whatever and I'm thinking something else in my mind and God has to be sitting up Lord have mercy gonna have to teach him again we can't fake out God like we, like we try to fake out each other and this is why he says verse 18 our conclusion, but grow. But, meaning as opposed to those things that was just said in verses 16 and 17, the caution I gave you to, to those who think they have a superior knowledge, those who are twisting the truth, I told you to beware. Avoid those things, but here's what you ought to do, but grow. In other words, the thing that's going to keep you from falling away into that mess, into that foolishness, is to do this. You can grow, but I'm going to teach you how to grow properly. He says, but grow, notice, and grow means to increase, to become greater in maturity. Spiritually, it refers to the non-stop progress in the development of the life of faith, which is key to authentic discipleship. So if we are authentic, we ought to always be growing. Is that all right? That don't mean we don't make mistakes. Amen, somebody. We, we fall down sometimes, but we got to get up. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Get up. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? It is the inward Christian growth that is essential to conforming to the likeness of Christ and inheriting eternal salvation. In other words, God is saying, I'm requiring each of you to grow so that you can be like my son. Stop, stop letting your mind tell you that you can't be like Jesus. Jesus was human. And he set the standard in his humanity that we can follow the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit and glorify God in this flesh. Watch this. The aim of every Christian is spiritual growth, Christ-likeness. But notice then what our growth is to be focused on. He says, grow in grace. 
Is that what your Bible says? Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now notice those who he talked about in verses 16 and 17, they were so-called growing in their own knowledge. Is that all right? In their own so-called superior knowledge. But he says, I want you to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Grace is that to which Jesus is the source and author. Grace is, he's the source of grace. He's where we get it. He's the author of it. You remember John, the Gospel of John chapter 1 and verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Then in verse 16 and 17 of John 1, he says, And of his fullness have we all received in grace for grace. Watch this. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Are we getting this? So when it comes to grace, Jesus, he says, grow in this. And guess what? We grow in it because Jesus is the author and the source of it. He's the one who gives it. But notice, we have to grow in knowledge. Knowledge is, is that to which Jesus is the object of. So guess what? We're not growing in our knowledge of ourselves and one another. We have to, as Christians, grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And here's the simple fact. When we grow in the knowledge of Jesus, then he will extend his grace. Are y'all getting that? But we need to understand this, this knowledge. John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The CEV says it like this, eternal life is to know you, the only true God, and to know Jesus Christ, the one you sent. Colossians 1, 9 and 10 says it like this. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and watch this, and increasing in the knowledge of God. You see, this knowledge that we're to grow in is not just merely a knowledge of scriptural knowledge of Jesus. Y'all ain't getting this. This knowledge is more than just a scriptural knowledge of Jesus. And I'm only bringing up the Greek because if you care to look up in your own time, that's great. This word knowledge here is gnosis. Okay? Gnosis. A word which is derived from genosko. Okay? It's not epinosis. Epinosis is that superior knowledge that these false teachers thought they had. All right? But those false teachers had no settled convictions. You have people who are in the, in the body of Christ who have no convictions at all in the scriptures. They're just tossed to and fro. If you ask them, well, what do you, what do you feel about this? What do you stand with this? Well, I don't know. They don't stand for anything. It's constantly changing. It's always vacillating. So when it comes to contend for the faith, they can't contend for the faith because they have no settled convictions. 
When God says it and I understand it, that's it. I'm convicted. It's not going to change 10 years from now. It's not going to change 20 years from now. And that's what's happening in the church. The enemy is trying to unsettle us from our convictions. Watch. This knowledge here, this gnosis, is an applied knowledge gleaned through personal and firsthand experience. I'm going somewhere, y'all. Watch this. This knowledge, or this personal and firsthand experience, connects the knowledge we have in theory to the knowledge in application, which is gained by a direct relationship. Y'all ain't getting it. I use this illustration a lot. I'm going to use it again. Just bear with me. I can go and sit in a class, Brother Mike, and learn how to swim. They'll give me flyers, tutorials, kick, stride, but I don't really know how to swim until I apply that knowledge by going and getting in that water and doing it. So I can have a theory from my knowledge of Jesus, but I really don't know him until I actually apply what I know about him in my life. I know that Jesus was despised and rejected of men. So when I, I know that, but when I get out here as a Christian and people despise me, people reject me because I'm living for him, then I get to know him a little better. Is that all right? Paul said in Philippians 3, 10 and 11, all oh, that I can know him. How you gonna know him, Paul? In a fellowship of his sufferings. People dogging you. You're not appreciated. Amen, somebody. Then you're starting to experience Jesus. Hey, Amen. Jesus was used and abused intentionally. And I'm so thankful for the passage of scripture when he was walking and he was using them. And he turned. Hey, man, brother, you kind. He turned and said, you follow me for the loaves and fishes. And not because you've seen the miracles. In other words, layman's terms, I know you're using me. But that's okay. I'm just continuing to show how good I am to you. And some people think they're getting over on you. <laughs> they, they, they just stupid. No, no, we just love the Lord. We love the Lord. And we know how good he was to us when we was using him. And by the way, we still do at times. And he's still long-suffering. He's still patient. Listen. understand our growth has to be in the knowledge of him and we need to understand that this knowledge is just not a scriptural knowledge this knowledge to know Jesus to have a saving knowledge of Jesus is not just simply knowing of him but coming to know him 
and possessing his person, his character, and his work, which are all essential to our spiritual welfare in this life. You remember, 1 John says in 1 John 2, 3 through 6, says, now by this we know him. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, amen somebody, truly the love of God is perfected in him or completed in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk or to live just as Jesus walked and lived. You see, knowing Jesus is more than just an emotional experience. Y'all ain't hearing that. More than just, oh, Jesus, hallelujah. Knowing Jesus is actually living the life. Amen, somebody. And when you Live like Jesus. Don't expect a pat on the back. Good job. There's no good job in this. We just do our duty. As Jesus taught us, even when you've done all that you were supposed to do, and we know we don't do that. Amen, somebody. He says, even when you've done all that you supposed to or commanded to do, you should still refer to yourself as unprofitable servant. So I know I haven't done everything I'm commanded to do, so I'm less than unprofitable. It says to grow in grace and in the knowledge. Watch this. Without coming to know Jesus intimately and personally, there's no grace. We can't be extended that grace unless we truly know him. I'm going to close by asking you to go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting with verse 7. See, Remember, Paul said, oh, I can know him, right? Oh, that I can know him. Fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable to him in his death. I, Paul was saying, I want to experience life just like Jesus did so that I, that I can also, too, experience his resurrection. But understand that that doesn't come without a price. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, if you have a say, amen. Word of God says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations because God allowed him to see the third heaven. Amen, somebody. There was given to me. Catch that. There was given to me. God sometimes, in his infinite wisdom, through his providence, gives us things that he knows will keep us close to him. I don't want to look at nobody. Amen. He gives us things that he knows will keep us close. Paul says, I, it was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. In other words, to keep me in check, to keep me dependent on God lest I depend on myself. 
because he says, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing, for this thing, I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Y'all ain't get that. Even though he knew God gave it to him, he still prayed for God to take it away. Lord, have mercy. We know God gave it to us. Hey, man, somebody. But now we say, Lord, please take it away. Lord, please take it away. I'm sorry. Forgive me, Lord. He said, I begged him three times. I wonder why three. He know Jesus didn't go past three. Amen, somebody. And he said to me, you see, just because God don't do what you ask him to do, don't mean that he don't answer. He said to me, watch this, my grace is sufficient. And when you look at this word sufficient, it's more than enough. When you get to dissect this, it means, Paul, you actually are better off with me keeping it in there and giving you my grace. Y'all ain't getting this. Y'all ain't getting this. You want me to remove it. I can take it away, but that ain't going to be better than you having it and having my grace. It's sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect or is completed in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Paul had to learn this, and we have to learn it. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest on me. Listen, we're walking, we're walking, we're walking, sometimes in our own power, which is truly never because we ain't got none. We're walking in our own power, and God is saying, listen. Don't worry about infirmities. Don't worry about trials and troubles. Embrace that. It's okay. Because when you're weak, I'm strong. When you can't go another foot, another inch, then I can come and do what I do. I'm on you then. And when I'm on you, Nothing can touch you. So Paul said, well, Lord, I, I want to be weak all the time so that you can be on me all the time. I don't want to ever think I'm strong. I don't want you to take away those instances where I think I'm standing. I want to be weak all the time. so that you can be over me in control. Listen. Therefore, I take pleasure. I take pleasure. Sometimes we got to get over our ego because sometimes we don't want people to see us weak. We don't want to see a, people, we don't want people to see that we're vulnerable. But that's all right. Because as long as God has got me, I don't care how I look to you. I don't care how I look to you. Is that all right? He says, therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses, in reproaches. When people are dogging me and I don't even know they're dogging me. When people act like they like me and I know they don't like me. I take pleasure in that. Thank you, Jesus. Is that all right? In necessities, when I don't have nothing, when I'm in need, 
I take pleasure in that because I know God going to come through. In persecution, in distresses, I'm worried. I'm concerned, Lord. We've been in a pandemic since March. All this social unrest, all this hatred. It's only God peeling back what's always been here. Is that all right? Now, I'm not talking about in color. I'm just talking about the evilness of men. Cain was evil. And nobody taught him how to be like that. Y'all ain't getting that. Watch this. For Christ's sake. He said, I take pleasure in those things for Christ's sake. So talk about me all you want to. Hate me all you want to. As long as I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do, I'm all right. For when I am weak, y'all ain't getting this. When I am weak, when I am weak, then I am strong. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Peter is teaching us we have to grow. We have to grow. It's essential that we grow. We can't sit up here wasting time. Amen. If you're not growing, you're dying. Amen, somebody. We have to grow. But we have to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You say, well, I don't think I can ever get there. Keep on trying. You say, I'm so far behind, aren't we all? I've I just done so many things. I fall in so many ways. I say to you, welcome. Welcome. You have sin problems, you in the right place. Let's continue to grow in him. And as we draw close to him, he's promised that he will draw near to us. Amen. I said enough. I said enough. Where are you? And if we're all honest about it, it's not where we, we need to be. But God be praised that he hasn't given up on us yet. You know, God don't give up, doesn't give up on us even when we give up on ourselves. What kind of love is that? Because y'all know how we get. I know I said I'm done, but I'm just, but y'all know how we get. When we're trying to help somebody and they ain't trying to help themselves, well, I ain't trying to help. That's, that's like the biggest turn off you can do. I'm trying to help you, and you, what? And God says to each and every one of us, I'm still here. Still got you. You failed today, I still got you. I'm still here. That's why when Adam and Eve sinned, God was still there. Where are you? Y'all would have just known 
while you were being tempted, I was here. And all you had to do was reach out. I would have dealt with Satan for you. Don't try to take on Satan by yourself. You, you can't win. You can't win. It's not even a match. It's, it's kind of like the Steelers and the... No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They'll cut that out the tape. But I'm not trying to be facetious. Sometimes when we get meat, we have to lighten it up a little so that we can digest it. God is good to us. Far better than we can ever be to ourselves. I've said enough again. If you're here and you've not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, watch this. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. So the Bible encourages us the day you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Obey him while you can. Well, I'll do it next week or I'll do it next month. You may not get to next month. If you know it now, do it now. And that encouragement is to us as well who have obeyed the gospel of Christ. You're not obeyed the gospel, you can come having heard. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We must believe that which we receive by faith. We must repent of our sins, confess before witnesses that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and then in obedience be buried in baptism for the forgiveness of our sin and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm so thankful to God for his spirit. Because in those moments of loneliness where there's nobody but you and God, the comforter, the helper, you don't even know how God works. All you know is that you feel better. And you don't know why. Consider where you are. 